So good morning, um, and thank you so much, Denisa. Uh, my name, as she said, is Allie Hard, and I'm a senior policy advisor at the Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Service. And I'd like to start today uh, by really thanking the conference organizers and the Shakopee, Mitawak, and Sioux community uh, for inviting me here uh, to join you today. It's really special and an honor to be with you. Um, before I begin my talk, I really want to take a moment to acknowledge the role of the United States federal government uh, that we've played in creating many of the food and nutrition inequities that we are here this week to discuss. Um, we have to start by acknowledging the role of the federal government in the removal of American Indians and Alaska Natives from their traditional lands and foodways, and the horrific re-education of American Indian and Alaska Native populations through boarding schools that were established with the express purpose of killing their traditional cultures and practices. We entered into hundreds of treaties with tribal nations and we've broken them. We have an obligation to meet our trust and treaty responsibilities and it's morally the right thing to do. I'm proud to be part of the Biden-Harris administration that recognizes these responsibilities and prioritizes advancing tribal sovereignty and equity. But I also wanna acknowledge that we have a lot of work to do and a long way to go. The work I will present today represents some really important early steps and successes, but we realize that there's a lot more work that will be needed. And we look forward to continuing to find ways to partner with American Indian and Alaska Natives and tribal governments in that work. And I also, before I start these slides, want to acknowledge my amazing USDA FNS colleagues who are here, um, and in particular, Barbara Lopez, um, because they really created these slides and they do the work every day. I get to be up here and talk about it, um, but they are the ones who do the work. And if you haven't met Barbara, um, please take a moment to do that. She's an extraordinary champion um, for tribal communities. So, thank you. Okay. So just a quick overview of my agenda. So I wanted today to talk to you about some of the overall um, initiatives that are happening at USDA Food and Nutrition Service and some opportunities for um, ways to get funding, get involved. Um, but I really wanna focus at the, at the end of my talk on our really exciting new self-determination project in the FDPIR program. Um, and I also am very excited that right after me will be Mr. Joe Van Alstein, who is gonna be talking about the work that his tribe is doing as part of that. So I'm gonna try not to steal his thunder because he's a lot more exciting to listen to than me, I promise. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk really quickly about nutrition secur security. Um, that is an initiative that our secretary is very excited about, um, so Secretary Tom Vilsack. Um, and we, you know, I want to, I want to recognize that uh, this term has been used a lot over the past year, but what's become increasingly clear um, is that people have a lot of different interpretations of what this term means. Um, so I want to kind of uh, set some parameters and um, explain a little bit about what we mean when we say this. So nutrition security is an emerging concept, um, and it aims to better recognize the coexistence of food insecurity and diet-related diseases and disparities. So that is nutrition security uh, means having consistent access, availability, and affordability of foods and beverages that promote well-being and prevent, and if needed, treat disease, particularly among racial and ethnic minority populations, lower income populations, rural and remote populations, tribal communities, um, and tribal communities. And nutrition security is distinct from food insecurity in a couple key ways. Um, so the first is that we, it recognizes that we are not all, uh, we do not all have access um, to what we need to maintain an active, healthy life. Um, and the second is that it emphasizes taking an equity lens to this work. Um, and we have four pillars that kind of guide our work in this area. Um, so just quickly to run through them. So the first is providing meaningful nutrition support uh, throughout the life, the life cycle. Um, the second is connecting all Americans with healthy, safe, and affordable food sources. Um, the third is developing, translating, and enacting nutrition science through partnership. And then finally, prioritizing equity every step of the way. And I hope that as I talk a little bit more about some of the programs that we're working on, you'll see that this framework kind of works throughout those programs, um, and it's really been guiding us in our work. So next, I just want to very briefly mention something called the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Um, so some of you, if you are nutrition educators, you might be very familiar with this. Um, but this is really a scientific document that we pull together every five years. Our department in uh, partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services. And it's a recommendation for uh, what folks can, can eat to have a healthy life. 
Um, and this is an area where I think um, we really are interested and eager to improve our partnerships with tribal communities. Um, and I want to lift up, I think it was mentioned yesterday as well, uh, there was an executive order from President Biden recognizing the importance of indigenous tribal and ecological knowledge. And I think that applies to food and nutrition too. And so I really want to invite you to engage with us in this process. We're eager to, to partner with you, work with you. Um, and for folks who are interested in following the process, you can uh, go on this link here, the website, um, and sign up for our email uh, news alerts. And you'll find out when they're asking for, for example, um, nominations to serve on the committee. Um, so we really, I want to, it's my goal <laughs> to make sure that we have really great nominations, including representatives of American Indian and Alaska Native populations uh, who are part of that committee as we make those decisions. So next, I want to talk a little bit about farm to school. So this is actually perfect because I know our last speaker spoke a little bit about this. Um, so farm to school is a program that we operate um, at the Food and Nutrition Service to really support um, the farm to school work that is happening in communities all across the country. Um, and so what we do is we work with various stakeholders and provide grants, trainings, and technical assistance. Um, and we help them uh, in conducting research to advance farm to school. Um, and so the goal is that we want to increase the availability of local and traditional uh, foods and school meals. We want to incorporate hands-on learning in the classroom. Um, and we want to incorporate uh, or encourage the incorporation of agricultural food and nutrition uh, content in the regular school curriculum. So those are sort of our, our big picture goals with this. Okay, and in Indian country, we think there's a real opportunity, um, and we've seen some great success in, uh, in Indian country with this program. Um, so specifically, We've seen that farm to school can connect communities to their local farmers and help producers build stronger ties to their community and their culture. Um, operating farm to school programs and schools that serve American Indian and Alaska Native students can help them connect to their history um, and expand markets for producers, tribal producers. Um, and it also can align really closely with tribes focus on food sovereignty because it helps, it can help to purchase food uh, that is uh, produced by tribal producers in school meal programs. Um, so this is just, I'm not going to go through all this, but just to show you, um, we've had really great success serving Indian country with this program, um, and we would like to continue that. So if you're interested um, in getting more involved, I want to, this is probably the most important slide I have in this program, um, showing you who is uh, really at the heart of this work and who you can reach out to um, to help you if you're interested in getting a program going. Um, so I want to really encourage you to do that. Um, and before I move on from talking about school meals and farm to school, I also want to acknowledge that we've heard a lot of uh, input and feedback in recent consultations and uh, listening sessions, and I'm sure for a long time, I'm new to this role, it's been two months for me, but I know that we, USDA, have heard about this for a very long time. Um, we've heard feedback about the desire to get traditionally uh, produced and slaughtered, field slaughtered uh, buffalo and bison into the school meal program so that they can purchase it. Um, so that's an issue that I'm actually uh, helping to lead at our agency to really move that forward. Um, and we're really excited and optimistic about what we'll be able to share on that soon. Um, and actually as part of that work, I'll be uh, in Pine Ridge in a couple of weeks um, for a tribal bison listening session. And we've been invited to uh, witness the uh, field slaughter of the bison, which is a real honor. And privilege. So I'm very excited for that and grateful. So then next, I want to get into FDPIR. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about some exciting news on the nutrition education front. Um, so, and I'll just level set and say, if, if folks are not familiar, FDPIR is a program that was started in 1977 and was an alternative to the SNAP program or food stamps. So the idea was that we were hearing that there were tribal communities that didn't have access to grocery stores to use SNAP benefits. And so we had you know, the idea of, okay, we will instead help them to, uh, to we're going to um, make American farm commodities available to them that they can purchase and provide directly to their communities in sort of a grocery store. It now looks basically like a grocery store, many of the um, programs that I've visited. And it's an alternative to SNAP for folks who can't access grocery stores. Um, now that landscape has shifted quite a lot um, recently. So that's, it's, there's been a lot of uh, development in the program since 1977. And I think we are doing a much better job of really working with tribes and making the program uh, into something that actually serves them. So I'm excited to talk more about that today. Um, 
And so on the nutrition education front, so historically we've had only $250,000 a year for nutrition education for tribes to do things like cooking demonstrations. Um, I've seen uh, in Menominee they have, they're hiring uh, an amazing uh, chef who's a member of their tribal nation um, to do cooking classes and demonstrations. Um, we've only had a tiny bit of money for that, but we asked for and Congress gave us $4 million a year. So that is a 16-fold increase, which is really, really exciting. Um, and we're doing a lot of work right now uh, with the National Association of FDPIR programs um, to figure out how best to use that money to support tribes and what they want to do to educate their communities. Um, and these are just a few best practices that we have heard from tribal leaders as we've been doing this work um, to advance the nutrition education programming. Um, and I also just want to quickly lift up, we do have a sharing gallery with some really excellent resources on FDPIR nutrition education, uh, most of which come from the tribal uh, programs themselves. So that's a great place to find some resources. Okay, so now to the exciting part, <laughs> I'm going to talk about our self-determination pilot, which we're really thrilled about. Um, so in, and this is just an overview again of FDPIR, we talked about that, okay. All right, so in the 2018 Farm Bill, um, we received authorization to conduct a demonstration project where tribes can purchase foods themselves for this program. So instead of ordering through us uh, farm commodities that uh, USDA orders, they can actually order their own food. So for example, um, they can go ahead and order uh, buffalo or bison that their tribe produced. So that is a really exciting um, step forward in self-determination, um, and it's something that tribes have been asking for for a very long time. So we're really happy that we're at this moment. Um, so some of the key differences, like I said, uh, you know, tribes can order themselves or not, depending on us. Um, and they only have to order enough for their caseload um, at their tribe. So they don't have to order enough for the whole national caseload. And that can be really helpful if you're talking about working with tribal producers. Okay. So again, this is a program that's a long time coming. Um, so stakeholders have been asking about this for a really, a really long time, and we're very excited to be implementing it and moving forward, even though it's just a pilot. Um, I do want to say, too, this is something where the Farm Bill is really important. That is what would give us authority to extend, expand this. Um, and I know Lexi talked this morning about uh, an opportunity to talk about the Farm Bill later today, so just emphasize that. Uh, but so some of the benefits that we've seen include advancing food sovereignty, supporting tribal economies. Um, like I said, a lot of the tribes that are involved in this are uh, procuring from tribal producers, which actually wasn't a requirement, um, but we are really pleased to see that. Um, and promoting the best practice of self-determination contracting. Okay, so these slides just show sort of some of the legal citations, if you want to look at that. Feel free, if you like reading laws, I do, <laughs> um, but most people don't. Uh, okay, so, but just really briefly here, I wanna emphasize there were some limitations that Congress gave us for the program. So um, we did, uh, you know, we had to do um, a situation where we were supplanting, not supplementing food. So that's one limitation that was in the farm bill. Um, so, you know, we were kind of stuck with that. So you had to kind of pick something to take out and then replace it. So that, that was the limitation. Um, and then also the foods had to be of similar or higher nutritional value as the foods that they were replacing. Okay, and then also there were some important provisions in there around consultation, um, and that's something that we, you know, do. Uh, it's, it's definitely part of our responsibility to do consultation um, anyways, but Congress also said, you know, you should do this, so we are doing that. Um, and we engage actually in six tribal consultations uh, when we were first getting this up and running, and we'll continue to do that as we make changes to the program, which I think is really important. Um, and we're learning from other agencies that have more experience in self-determination programming. Um, USDA is pretty new to this, so we thought it would be a good idea for us to learn from our uh, federal partners. Um, so we did uh, have a formal consultation with the Department of the Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, and we have a formal partnership with them to help us in implementation. Um, so this is just a quick overview of the scope of the funding. So it's $9 million in total so far, which is pretty significant for this, um, this program. Okay. And then just the selection process. So we received in, uh, we put out our uh, notice uh, for applications in January of 2021. Um, and then we received seven proposals from eight tribes that were interested in uh, participating. We have one that's a joint um, program. 
Uh, and the proposals as a group um, provide FNS an opportunity to test how tribal procurement can work um, under, this, under this model. Um, and it really, we're including small and large um, tribes. Uh, we're, uh, we have tribes that are really representing geographic diversity and doing foods that are um, really quite diverse, and that's exciting for us. Um, and so all seven proposals were selected, which is great, um, and awards were finalized in October 2021. Okay, so this gives you the list of the tribes that were selected, that applied and were selected. Um, and then this is just a quick overview showing we really got a, a great diversity of programs, um, foods that they were gonna do, um, and, uh, and that the funding kind of represents uh, the size, gives you a sense of the size of the program. Okay, and they represented all of our geographic regions. This is just our FNS regional uh, breakdown. So um, in case folks don't know, we have regional offices in each of these regions, and they're a great resource as well if you're looking to engage with USDA, looking for grant funding. Um, they're really excellent. Um, and I wanna recognize that we have some of our Mountain Plains regional staff here too. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy, she's raising her hand. Okay. Um, so, I was really privileged, actually a few weeks ago, I got to visit the joint program on Oneida and Menominee. Um, it was wonderful. We had a meal prepared by uh, the, the chef who's a, a member of the Menominee Nation, um, as I mentioned, using some of these foods that they were able to procure themselves. Um, and it was really, really special to witness and be a part of that. Um, so they're doing a whole range. They've got uh, beef and bison from their farm. They've got apples uh, from their own farm. Um, they've got uh, lake trout, which is from, uh, they're working with another tribe, uh, Red Lake, to provide that. Um, and then they've got wild rice from another tribe as well. And just some picture, oops, some pictures you can tell I'm, some of these were me and I'm not a great photographer. <laughs> um, so Spirit Lake wild rice that they've got. These are the apples from their own farm um, and the Red Lake trout. Okay, um, and then this is Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Um, so they supplanted a whole bunch of the produce um, and the wild rice, uh, and they are doing tribally produced options for those. And then as well as uh, some white fish, um, carrots, potatoes, a whole bunch of produce here. Some pictures. Okay, and then uh, I definitely don't want to steal the thunder here because we've got Joe Van Alstein who's going to talk about um, his tribe, Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians, um, and the work they're doing, which is quite impressive. So I'll let him talk to you about that. Um, we've got Chickasaw. They're doing ground beef and roast beef. We've got uh, Mississippi Band of Choctaw. They're doing a whole bunch of uh, produce, which is great. And then, oh yeah, I loved these pictures of the collards. This one's great because you can see the the scale. <laughs> yeah, pretty impressive. Thank you to that grower. <laughs> um, they've got some turnips, and then we've got lummy. They're doing salmon, halibut, prawns, shrimp, and crab. And then Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, they're doing halibut, which also looks really beautiful. Um, so just as in terms of next steps, uh, we're going to be doing some modifications to our existing contracts um, and extensions. Um, and then, and we've gotten so far extension requests from six of the eight tribes, and I, I think uh, they got some news about uh, moving forward with those today, so we're really excited about that. Um, and we have awarded so far $3.5 million in contracts. Um, so uh, it's a total, we've gone through a total of $6 million of our nine. Um, so we're gonna be using the balance for these extension and modifications. Um, and then we also are interested in expanding to new tribes. Um, and so that's gonna be coming up in the next fiscal year. So really wanna um, encourage you all to think about this. Um, I hope you'll be inspired by Joe in particular. He's a lot more inspiring than me, I promise. Um, so please, you know, and I'm sure he'd be t happy to chat with folks too about, about this. And, um, you know, and I'm sure he can give you an honest assessment of of the pluses and the minuses, you know, the challenges, but it's new, we're working through it, and we really, really um, are excited to move forward and, and do more of this. Um, so I just, I wanna end there and really thank um, everyone again, again, the conference organizers um, and the tribe for having me here. It's an incredible opportunity. Um, 
And I really look forward to working and continuing to partner with you all. One final housekeeping item. Um, so I am also involved in our infant formula uh, response work because we have the WIC program um, under our agency. And so as a, uh, a significant consumer of infant formula through that program, we're very involved in the federal response to what's happening on infant formula right now. Um, so I just want to invite you all. We're very interested in learning more about what's happening, what you all are seeing in Indian country with this issue. Um, so today at 4 p.m. Uh, in Owana, uh, excuse me, Owatana 3. Uh, I will be, along with some of my colleagues from USDA, doing a little impromptu listening session on this. So please come uh, tell us about your experiences with this. Um, we really want to, you know, listen and try to be helpful as best we can. All right. Thank you.